Today I'm going to talk about the basal ganglia and their connections. So basically the definitions are not clear what exactly are the basal ganglia, but we're going to focus on motor coordination. So we're going to include those nuclei that mainly belong to the motor uh, group of the basal ganglia, uh, which are the chaotic nucleus and putamen, together called as striatum, which you already know from uh, the anatomy classes, and uh, globus pallidus or pallidum. Plus, we have the subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra, uh, which are functionally in very close association with the, the um, basal ganglia, or they are part of the basal ganglia. In broader sense, there are several other nuclei which you can list to the basal ganglia, but we are not going to deal with those today. So the terms, if you say striatum, uh, you can find some other synonyms, but basically we mean the caudate nucleus and the putamen together. You also mentioned the lentiform nucleus, which uh, is composed of the putamen and the uh, pallidum, which has an internal and an external part, the pallidum, also abbreviated as GPE and GPI. This is how I'm going to use these in later uh, uh, charts. I just mentioned very briefly the ventral striatum, uh, which is also called the limbic striatum here in the ventral part of the striatum. Uh, these are some tiny uh, small nuclei in the basal part of the frontal lobe, uh, like the nucleus accumbens, uh, etc., which you don't have to learn by name. Uh, I just wanted you to hear about these because these are involved in Alzheimer's disease. So here are the basal ganglia pictures that you already know from anatomy class. This is where we find the caudate nucleus, the uh, lentiform nucleus, putamen, pallidum. These are the main parts of the basal or deep nuclei. The um, uh, development, just very briefly, here you can see, uh, indicated by yellow, uh, the telencephalon during development and uh, there is a deep part, a deep ganglionic hill appearing and um, then the axons growing from the uh, developing neurons kind of cut this or separate, divide this ganglionic hill into two. This will be the caudate nucleus and the putamen and the uh, descending fibers will form the internal capsule. And the caudate nucleus follows the rotation, the C-shaped rotation of the hemispheres, and this is why the uh, caudate nucleus has this shape with the body, with the head, body, and the tail of the caudate nucleus. And the putamen does not follow this, so it retains its oval shape. And uh, the uh, lateral ventricle is also uh, uh, following this growth of the uh, neurons with the uh, telencephalon, with the hemispheres. So this is why the caudate nucleus neighbors or borders parts of the lateral ventricle in almost every part except for the occipital lobe. And the other parts of the other members of the basal ganglia develop from the uh, subthalamus and uh, from the part which is part of the uh, diencephalon, epithalamus, thalamus, subthalamus and hypothalamus and from the subthalamus we have the subthalamic nucleus and the pallidum developing which uh, is of interest to us. In the flexic cut you can find all these members that you already discussed in class. If you get this question in the exam then you're supposed to say uh, some words about the theory, also about the connections. And this is where, in this uh, oblique cut between corpus callosum and the lateral sulcus, this is where you can uh, best make the basal ganglia visible. So this is what we are going to mention today. What are the connections between these different parts of the basal ganglia? The most important uh, connection is that with the cortex, uh, from every cortical part, there is an input to the basal ganglia. And uh, then the uh, connection is going back 
to the motor part of the cortex via these two main loops of motor coordination. These are actually very important parts of the so-called extrapyramidal system, which I already mentioned at the brainstem and spinal cord lectures, that it's, a, it's an old word. We don't have two systems. We don't have a pyramidal and an extrapyramidal system. <clears throat> These two work together. If you know how to use this, uh, it's good to use it. And these two different loops um, are very important in motor coordination. So from the cortex, information goes back to the cortex, but already to specific areas involved in the motor coordination. These are these regulating loops, and one very important loop is the striatal or basal ganglia loop. The other one is the cerebellar loop, cortex, cerebellum, and back to the cortex. Uh, we already talked about the thalamus. You know that thalamus is the gate for consciousness, but not only for consciousness, but the gate to the cortex. So all, both these loops go back to the cortex, to the motor cortex, through the thalamus. The thalamus, which parts of the thalamus? Obviously the motor parts, the VAVL, ventral anterior, ventral lateral nuclei. So, as I mentioned, they work together and we have these multisynaptic neuronal loops, as I already mentioned. So, uh, if we want to say an example, for example, you want to catch a ball, then <clears throat> this is how these systems work together. Obviously, many parts of the cortex are involved in this play, in this movement. Uh, you remember things, you see the ball, so the occipital lobe, the visual cortex, um, you hear something, you decide to do it, so it's a voluntary movement, you are motivated, so many different parts of the cortex are involved in this uh, decision. I want to catch the ball. If you have already practiced it, so there is a learned movement, then the prefrontal lobe has a plan for it. Here is the plan. Uh, uh, scheme for the uh, movements, but the details to make the movements smooth, we need the extrapyramidal system, the basal ganglia and the cerebellar loops. The details, uh, especially these um, listed here, are functions of the basal ganglia to ensure that the tone, muscle tone, balance, posture, co-movements, like when you walk your arms, move along, uh, the facial expression, automatic movements, uh, and here learning has, is a very important component. Of course, when you learn a movement, it goes much more smoothly. This is the function of the basal ganglia. Agonistic, antagonistic muscles uh, inhibiting unnecessary movements, which is just as important as stimulating the wanted movements. Initiation and termination of the movements. And you will see in some diseases, this is exactly what uh, one of the problems is, that the patients cannot initiate uh, or change a movement. And then the details are worked uh, by these two systems, and then the order goes back to the cortex through the thalamus, and then the action can uh, start. So these are the details we're going to discuss and uh, I just listed with smaller letters here some other functions and um, cognitive, limbic, uh, emotional functions and these are also, can be also lesioned in, uh, in different diseases of the basal ganglia. So this is just the uh, simple chart uh, uh, showing the connections of the basal ganglia and um, this shows that the cortex, many different parts, will be activated through the thalamus again. And these are the main basal ganglia, the uh, uh, striatum, pallidum, substantia nigra, and subthalamic nucleus, uh, which can be connected to each other by direct and indirect uh, pathways. So if the input, which is the striatum, is connected directly to the output, which is the internal part of the pallidum, this is with the black arrows, it's just one connection, and the indirect is involving the subthalamic nucleus.
This uh, seems to be a simple chart, but many things are missing from this picture that you need to know. So I show you a, a chart that is that includes everything that you need to know for the exam. It seems to be a little bit complicated at first, and this is why I show you these memes, uh, which was sent by one of my students a few years ago, uh, that uh, really is a shocking sight at first. But if you go one by one, and we will also draw it together, step by step, then you will see that this chart includes most of the information, all of the information you need to know for the exam and it's not so complicated. What it shows is that uh, here we have the cortex. Many, many parts, that's why we have uh, many arrows here. Many parts of the cortex stimulate the input of the basal ganglia, which is the striatum. The output is the pallidum. Uh, the main output is the internal part of the pallidum. The thickness of the arrows also show how important a connection is. And uh, the other output is the substantia nigra, the pars reticularis, and with thinner arrow. And you can see that the main output goes through the thalamus back to the cortex. Which parts of the thalamus? Obviously the motor nuclei, the VAVL of the thalamus. So, many parts of the cortex, striatum, then the output through the thalamus back to the cortex. And here we have direct and indirect connections. This is what I, um, I'm going to show in the next few uh, charts. I'm going to skip through these pictures. You can take a look at them from the lecture material. But all this is unnecessary if you understand the one chart. I just wanted to show you that there are many other uh, books and, and uh, types of representation, how you can uh, show the afferent and efferent connections, but everything is included in that one picture. So I'm going to jump through these uh, afferent connections and efferent connections of the striatum and then the uh, subthalamus, which is in reciprocal connection with the pallidum, both afferent and efferent is with the pallidum, and then the afferent and efferent connections of the pallidum on this side with black arrows, the afferent, and then this side the efferent connections. So again, the simple chart and the complicated one. I also indicated here that this is the most important slide which summarizes uh, everything. So let's go uh, one by one. Let's start with the direct pathway. So here you can see what does direct mean, that the input and output part are in direct connection with each other. So thalamus activates the cortex when it is not inhibited. Also in this chart you can see which is the stimulatory and which is the inhibitory pathway. The stimulatory pathways work with glutamate and the inhibitory with GABA. So here you can see thalamus stimulates the motor cortex. If it is not inhibited, because the main output of the basal ganglia is inhibition. But as you see through the direct pathway, striatum is stimulated. Then it inhibits the pallidum, uh, so the inhibition is inhibited, which means that the output of this system, of the direct pathway, is stimulation. This is what is summarized here. The direct pathway facilitates movements. So let's see the indirect pathway. So in the indirect pathway, you can see that the input and the output are not directly connected to each other, but through the subthalamic nucleus. So from the striatum, there is input to the external part of the pallidum, and then through the subthalamic nucleus, input, output back to the internal part of the pallidum. So here we have a plus uh, output. So it means that the inhibitory pathway is stimulated, which means that the indirect pathway inhibits the thalamus, so the thalamus is not able to activate the cortex.
Of course, these things are not that simple. So obviously there are thousands of other factors and connections. But basically we can say that the direct facilitates and the indirect inhibits the movement. This is what the II stands for, inhibit, uh, indirect inhibition. That's easy to remember. And the last thing to complete the picture with is the substantia nigra, this big red arrow, uh, which is the dopaminergic pathway between the sparse compacta of the substantia nigra and the striatum. This is the nigrostriatal pathway, which has dopamine as a transmitter. And through two different receptors, D1 and D2 receptors, it is able to uh, stimulate, facilitate movement. How? It stimulates the direct pathway and inhibits the indirect pathway. So this together facilitates movement. And so if you know these connections, that's fine. These thin arrows show that there are some other output parts of the system as well. The pars reticularis of the substantia nigra is also an output and the output goes not only to the thalamus but also part of the system goes to the reticular formation, especially the reticular formation of the brainstem and from there the descending pathway to the spinal cord the reticulospinal tract, the tectospinal tract, so the extrapyramidal descending tracts, which also influence movements. Uh, you can find many other summary pictures, and uh, but as I said, this includes everything, and now we are going to draw this together. So now let's draw the connections of the basal ganglia together. So, as we said, here we put the cortex and we indicate the motor cortex separately and we said that the thalamus activates the motor cortex. Uh, of course, starting from the motor nuclei of the thalamus, the ventral anterior and ventral lateral nuclei. So the thalamus activates the cortex if it is not inhibited. And from all parts of the cortex, the basal ganglia receive their uh, input, and especially the input part of the basal ganglia, which is the striatum. This is the main input, and it receives connections from many parts of the cortex and from many other parts of the brain. This is a positive, so glut uh, glutamatergic connection. The main output of the basal ganglia is the uh, pallidum, globus pallidus, the external and the internal part and the uh, internal part is the main output and between striatum and internal globus pallidus there can be a direct or an indirect connection. The direct connection is between striatum and pallidum. This is a direct connection. The output of the pallidum is an inhibitory pathway, so it inhibits the thalamus, and this is the main output of the basal ganglia, that's why the arrow is thick. These are both inhibitory, working with GABA, so we are actually ready with the direct connection between striatum and pallidum internal part. Inhibition of the inhibition means stimulation, basically. So the thalamus is uh, able to stimulate the cortex through the direct pathway. For the indirect pathway, we need another nucleus, which is the subthalamic nucleus. And 
uh, there is a direct connection between input and output. This is called the direct pathway. The direct pathway first goes to the external polydon, then to the subthalamic nucleus, and then to the internal polydon. This is inhibitory, inhibitory, and stimulatory. So there is an extra stimulatory pathway or connection, which means that the internal pallidum is um, uh, stimulated, so it means that the, this negative output is stimulated, so the thalamus will be inhibited. This is how the indirect or indirect pathway is inhibiting the movement. And we need one more nucleus, which is a very important connection. This is the substantia nigra. It has two parts, the uh, pars compacta and the pars reticularis. From the pars compacta, there is a very important connection to the striatum. This is the nigrostriatal pathway. Or nigrostriatal tract, which works with dopamine. And this ends on D1 and D2 receptors, stimulates the direct and inhibits the indirect pathway. From the pars reticularis, there is also an output, so this is part of the output, just not as important as the uh, polydom. So there is an output to the thalamus, and also from both, there is an output to the uh, brainstem. Especially to the extrapyramidal tracts. So, if you practice this, it is a very simple thing that you have to know for the exam. Thank you. And at the end, let's see how this whole system fits into the motor coordination system. You will have a separate lecture on that system, but, and you will see this picture many times, but you can see that these two loops, the cerebellar loop, and the basal ganglia loop works through the thalamus and back to the motor cortex. And now let's see some examples of diseases. Obviously the motor symptoms will dominate these diseases, but not only, so we have other uh, symptoms as well. The components are uh, tone, mimic uh, facial expression, muscles, agonistic, antagonistic movement, posture problem, too little or too uh, strong movements, hypo and hyperkinesia. The hypokinetic uh, diseases, among the hypokinetic diseases, Parkinson's disease is the one that you have to know with name and the main symptoms and what the problem is. The others I just mention as interesting things. So like chorea is uh, uh, striatal degeneration. We have uh, the uh, uh, very major form, the Huntington's chorea and the chorea minor which is reversible, it can be healed uh, in pregnancy and rheumatic uh, fever, but the, unfortunately Huntington chorea is not curable. This is hyperkinesia, so two strong movements with the distal muscles. Just like balismus and hemibalismus is a problem in the subthalamic nucleus and it's two strong movements in the proximal muscles, so it's also hyperkinesia. But the one we ask with the, the main symptoms is Parkinson's disease. Here you can see the substantia nigra in a normal brain and you can see that the dopaminergic neurons degenerate in Parkinson's disease. This is the cause of the disease. Uh, the main problem is that this dopaminergic movement facilitator nigrostriatal pathway is lesioned. And uh, the main symptoms hypokinesia as dopamine facilitates movement. This is one of the important symptoms. Increased muscle tone, rigidity, uh, 
and we have tremor, especially on the hand. Um, we have a shaking hand. This is uh, how actually Parkinson first described it, shaking palsy uh, because of the uh, shaking. There are many other symptoms uh, of the patients with uh, slow uh, steps, very uh, bad change, very hard changing of the movement, initiation of the movement, a decreased facial expression, and uh, you can see that the posture uh, changes, very small letters, writing, etc., etc. You, you will learn it in detail, of course, in neurology, as it is a very common disease. And I mentioned very briefly two others, uh, Kern, which in German means nucleus. So you can see here that bilirubin uh, actually stains the uh, striatum yellow. And this is why it's called Kern icterus. And there is another disease which you will learn in neurology as hepatolenticular degeneration. And the names tell you that it includes the liver and the lentic form nucleus, so basal ganglia are degenerated, it's a copper metabolism disease. We don't ask these, just the Parkinson's disease, and with this I would like to thank you for your attention.